Town Hall Academy, episode 62. You're not pointing fingers. You, you just want to know what happened and, and, you know, what happened with that comeback and ways to improve and get feedback and get the buy-in because it's not about you. It's about them. And they're going to give you a lot of information too. The technicians could give you a ton of information about what's going on. And so can the service advisors. If your techs don't have time, then you have to slow them down. Sometimes you got to slow down to speed up. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, automotive aftermarket professionals, to the Town Hall Academy, episode 62. And we're talking comebacks. Yes, comebacks. My panel will discuss the prevention, the costs, and, of course, your reputation as it relates to the dreaded comeback. You are going to hear from Joe Marconi, John Long, and Gary Keyes. Carm Capriato here thanking Jasper Engines for supporting the Town Hall Academy. You know you've got customers whose old engine or transmission's going to wear out. And when that day comes, Jasper will be there for you and will be the supplier to remember. Jasper's remanufactured products cost considerably less than a new vehicle and is a perfect option for your customer. So it just makes sense to choose Jasper. And keep in mind, today's podcast has a sister video. If you want to see the discussion in action, you can find it at remarkableresults.biz slash A062. You'll also find extended bios on my guests and links to their previous episodes. And a great feature on the show notes page is the episode's outlined talking points. No need to take notes. They're already done for you. There's also some special mentions in this episode and a download on comeback costs that you can find on the show notes page. All the links are right there. Have I ever told you how much I love to hear from you? I read every email. Reach out to me at carm at remarkableresults.biz. Please let me know what's on your mind, who I should be interviewing, and what topics you'd like to see discussed on the Academy. And don't forget about the Remarkable Results radio listening app. Find it on your app store or at remarkableresults.biz slash app. I love how smart it is because it always knows where you left off. Now get ready for another great Academy lesson on comebacks as we talk about the costs, the prevention, and the impact on your reputation. With me is Joe Marconi from Osceola Garage, a multi-shop owner and part-time business coach for Elite Worldwide. John Long's here, partner in Shirts Auto Service in Shirts, Texas, and Gary Keyes from E&M Motors in Stewart, Florida. You'll discover three critical areas that this team agrees are the root causes of comebacks. As with all Town Hall Academies, your learning curve never sounded so good. Joe, you know, I see your talking points in front of me. It looks like it's all about QC to help make that, that whole prevention piece. Well, yeah, I think the quality control starts at the entire process. Uh, if you look at the, um, the way most shops handle quality control, it's at the end of the process, which you need to have some sort of quality control list, uh, quality control uh, process. But I think it's more important that we take a page from the Japanese from Toyota and what they did in the eighties uh, when they took over what the, they were known for quality is that they built quality into the process. So like the legendary coach, John Wooden used to say, um, don't worry about the score, worry about the details of the game and the score will take care of itself. So while I'm not discounting the need for a quality control process at the end, if you adopt the, the process and empower people to be able to literally stop the line if they see something that not going the way it should be, that will improve the comebacks down the road. I'll give you one example. Um, let's say a technician recognizes that a water pump has a known failure and, you know, his production has to be, you know, he has to maintain production, maintain production. But if he was, if he was somehow empowered or given the ability to say, you know what, we've had a high failure rate on this particular brand water pumps. Let's put a stop, let's put a stop down right now and say, do we really want to install this pump? Let's, let's take a look at that. And I think that goes along with everything else. Um, I think that the, the, instead of concentrated on quota so much and concentrated on quality in the process, you will, you will in the long run reduce those comebacks. Um, productions, I know production has to be, set. I know that we all 
Labor production is is critical. I understand that. I've been I've been before I became a shop owner, I was a technician, so I know exactly how critical labor production is. But if we could somehow instill that quality is throughout the process, in the long run, uh, we will reduce comebacks. John Long, you uh, absolutely are a, a QC guy when it comes to processes, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you have to. That's the only way that you're going to be able to get through the whole process and reduce your comebacks. You know, it starts at the very beginning, just like Joe was saying, and goes all the way through that process. You know, one thing that's helped us tremendously is, you know, our dig- we use digital inspections. I know not, not many people out there use them still. They're still kind of new to the game. Um, but doing that has just tremendously helped us reduce the amount of waste um, and, and parts, you know, getting wrong parts, getting parts that we shouldn't be using, um, helping the technicians find everything up front so we can notify the customer up front. And then we even have a QC process regarding those digital inspections at the very end that makes sure everything gets triple checked by a different technician, it's not the same technician. So it's another set of eyes on the process. On the vehicle. John, you're bringing up a great pointer. Joe, are you doing DVI? Yes. Uh, Gary? Uh, we're starting DVI now, yes. Okay, so, you know, let's pause for a moment, take a little side trip as to the value that a DVI system can have in building quality in the process of repair. John, are you using uh, your, your DVI for that specifically? Yes. Yes. It's, it's all about building quality and for the customer, you know, giving them as much value for everything that we do. So the, the world knows it as digital vehicle inspections, and it's really even heavier than that, if you will, where you can actually create a, um, a process on, on repair. For example, if you, like you said that Joe on that water pump, if you knew there was a particular model, I mean, a toughy, you literally could create the process around that particular piece. You're adding the QC inside the process. I mean, th- I think that's your point. Exactly. Exactly the point. And this goes along with having different meetings and having feedback from the technicians, uh, documentation, every comeback should be documented to find out whether it's a technician error, a training error, communications error, a part failure, whatever it is. So you need, in addition to all the processes, you need a process after the comeback has occurred to make sure to do your best to learn from it so it doesn't happen again. So it's all about the process. Is this a surprise piece for DVI to have, you haven't gone that much further than just inspections? I, I think it makes it better and more efficient. I don't think it's a surprise as much as it just makes it more, it brings it out. It brings it more to light. I guess what I mean, it's not a, let me rephrase that, Joe. Um, it's a surprise that DVI can do more than just inspect. Oh, vehicles. absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You're correct. I agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I don't think, you know, yeah. DVI was intended for that, but us shops have developed a process to use it more for our quality of control on our own end. Okay, Gare, you're hearing what we're talking about. Um, are you going to use your DVI deeper than you expected? Um, just getting started into it, so I, I really can't tell you how deep we're going to go into it, but uh, it's exciting to, to start using it. Um, definitely, yes. So your opinion on the whole procedures piece, um, testing, installation, training, give us, give us your perspective. Okay, to me, comeback prevention starts at the front door when the customer walks in. Um, does your service advisor know what questions to ask? Um, questionnaires for drivability, um, noises, um, and does he have the ability to transmit that information to the technician and the technician that needs to understand you can't just write check check engine light on you need to you know we use questionnaires the detailed questionnaires for that and uh, training does the tra- does the technician have the training the tooling to accurately diagnose the problem and give you a give you a decision great point we uh, we did an episode uh, uh a town hall academy on the communications between the service advisor and the technician. And one of the big takeaways of, from that was to write a novel. 
and that the service advisor needs to really get deep and involved and do everything you said. And would you guys agree that that really starts a good uh, comeback prevention Absolutely. Uh, more strategy. More information oh, yeah. you get to the tech, the better he can handle the, the uh, diagnosis. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, matter of fact, I think that you have to instill into the technicians that mindset that they're not going to accept uh, a repair order that says, like Gary said, check engine light right. on. That's not acceptable to the technician. And again, that goes back to the process. So a technician can stop that process right there and says, I'm not going to accept that. Uh, check battery. Well, what does that mean? Right. Check battery. So yeah, I think Gary's a hundred percent. He's dead on there when he says that uh, the process starts at the very beginning. That's a great way to put it. Guys, let's talk culture. You know, I, I know that your companies are very strong with culture. Um, the successful guys have a very strong business culture. Where's the comeback piece fit in? Joe, you mentioned meetings. Yeah, well, well, you're correct. And I think that culture, instead of putting the emphasis on production has to be on quality instead of quality has to be on quality. And because like I said earlier, the score will take care of itself. If you don't have a culture of caring, a culture of quality that starts from the top, then the rest is going to just start falling apart. So yeah, you have to have through meetings. Um, you have to re at every meeting, you have to reemphasize your vision, your goals, um, you know, and talk about these things and open, open, discussion where you're not pointing fingers. You, you just want to know what happened and, and you know, what happened with that comeback and ways to improve and get feedback and get the buy-in because it's not about you. It's about them. And they're going to give you a lot of information too. The technicians could give you a ton of information about what's going on. And so can the service advisors. John Long, take me to a meeting. You had a comeback. You figured it out. Now you're sitting down with your people. Uh, I think it just, goes back to what Joe says. You have to figure out what happened, why did it happen, and what can we do to prevent it in the future. Um, and, and you just got to discuss all three of those things and come to a conclusion at the end of of what are we going to do? You know, what what was the root cause? How are we going to fix it? And what are we putting in place to prevent it in the future? How many of you guys actually write down your comebacks yes. in a spreadsheet? Yes. You learn from them. You talk to them. You've got the column for the tech. You've got the column for the process. Joe, yeah. bring us there because the people that are going to listen and watch this, help, help them understand why. why well, so well, because you want, you want to know exactly. First of all, every, every comeback has to be logged on a, some sort of a spreadsheet. And you want to know exactly what happened. Was it technician's fault, a part error? If it was a part failure, then you have to uh, document it. where did you purchase that part from and go one step further. What brand part? So just because you bought it from a, let's say, Napa or, or Advanced Auto or CarQuest, it doesn't mean that you know what the manufacturer of that part was. So that, that's important. You want to know what your loss was too. What, what was the loss in labor time? What was, did you, did you, what was the loss for a rental car, hotel? You had to put somebody up in a hotel, whatever it was. And then you have to track that. Now, there's some gray areas that, and if it's a gray area, I don't immediately point to the technician because being a former technician, it's not, sometimes there are gray areas. But if it's a communications problem, like, like Gary was saying about it starts from the beginning, that's a great point. In other words, did the information get transferred? So the time has to be logged. The technician that, that, that occurred, was it a part failure? Um, the, the manufacturer, that, where did you purchase that part from? So all this has to be logged on a spreadsheet and then has to be tracked. And this has to be brought out in, in a meeting where everybody can see it, put it up on a screen. Everybody can see what's going on here. Critical, critical to your success. Any of you guys actually change your procedure inside the company from a learning about what happened with the combat? Change. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we change if we find a product that fa the failure rate is too high, we change, we change product lines. And, as, and it exactly. goes back to training on your service advisor or your parts person. You, you know, after through several uh, attempts to, you know, re rectify the comebacks that, you know, this part's not going to last. So you learn through hard knocks, but, uh, you know, you, eventually you may have to change suppliers on a, on a certain part. Good point. And the reason you would change suppliers is the trend in your, in your spreadsheet 
guys would be showing you the brand, the brand, the brand, because not every time it is the brand. I mean, there are other reasons why comebacks happen. You can't always just nicely pick, you know, the part supplier or the brand. But yes, I guess it's extremely critical to look at that trend line. John, that uh, anything uh, cream up that, that you could see, I mean, without mentioning brand or supplier, you know, that's, that's trends on actually parts that are bad? Yeah, I mean, we've we've seen it all the time. I mean, over the years, I mean, I've changed brake pad lines three times. I've changed water pump lines twice. You know, thermostats the same way. It's just, you if you don't track it, like Joe says, you don't know. And that's the only way that you're going to know is by tracking it. And you, and you have to be able to change. You know, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're you're going to keep having those comebacks, and that's not good. <laughs> you know, that's going to you lose the trust in the, that the customer has in you. Hey, I'm with Brian Weeks from ATC Auto Center. Brian, why Jasper engines and transmissions? So I think Jasper. The reason why we uh, chose to deal primarily with Jasper is. Uh, the quality of the product and the people. I know that it is a uh, associate owned company, but it's more about the people. They do what they do uh, in this industry that is tough and they stay on top of the cutting edge engineering, changing and maybe developing ways around uh, known problems and issues. So they're adding value. They're making things better. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they're taking a situation that you may have a common failure with and going in, taking it apart, going through the engineering, the R&D department and saying, okay, how can we make this better? And then from that standpoint, it comes to us that at the end of the day, the end user gets much more value for the dollar that they spend. Hey, Brian, thanks for your time. Carm, thank you. In episode 182, I interviewed Bobby Bassett from Gates. And uh, he did a cooling systems comeback episode, and it was short, sweet, and to the point. <laughs> and he says, um, there's a do-right rule on the cooling system issues. And he said, I can't remember the exact number, he says, but we could almost guarantee no comebacks on water pumps, installations, if there was a certain procedure done right. Joe, any opinion on something like that? Well, I don't. I, I don't. It was about flushing. It was about that if the flush you know, wasn't I, yeah, done. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I've heard this before. We had the same issue back in the 90s with, with fuel pumps. And the manufacturer came to us and said, well, that's because you, you're not flushing out the, the, the you know, draining the tank. And, you know, there's a lot of different sides. And, and they're talking from their perspective. In a perfect world, yeah, perfect world, you want to change, you want to flush it out really good. You want to change the hoses. You want to change the thermostat. You want to do all this thing. But the, but the, the, from my perspective, from what I see, I've been around a long time. The, the, the quality of some brands are in question. And, and, and no matter what you do, the quality is in question. We have the same problem with not only water pumps, fuel pumps, steering gears, steering racks. And, and I understand what they're saying, how to prevent it. I understand what their objective and their agenda. But the sad fact is that we have a, we have a part quality problem in this country. And it's driven by low price, driven by the market and economics. So um, perfect world, I agree with him. But the real world is you're going to have part failures because of poor quality. I don't mind taking a little branch and talking about parts quality here. Gary, in trending and in, in watching your trends, have you purposely made brand switches because of an inordinate amount of comebacks? I wouldn't say an inordinate amount of comebacks, but um, we do pick the brands that we trust. And through hard knocks, we know which ones last. Um, I'm not going to cut corners to save customer three, four dollars on a on a part, we're going to buy the best parts we find and guarantee them for as long as we can. Um, one thing I do is when I get, when I get a product that I trust and it comes back through my years of association with ASA and every, I know a lot of their manufacturers reps or actually people in the factory. So I will call them personally and say, there's a problem with this product. Let's find out what it is. I don't want to send it back as a defect and have it land in a hump of uh, defects on the floor somewhere. And a lot of them will send me a, a shipping label. Let's send, they'll send it back. Let's look at it and see what went wrong. My goal is to 
make the product better so somebody else doesn't run into the same problem down the road. That's typically what we expect when we send a labor claim up, that they're going to actually, you know, do the right diligence at their end, figure out what it was. Even if you get paid, you'd want, you would expect that you did all that extra work, not only to get your money back, but to, you know, help them at their end. Gary, give us anything ever come of those communications where they said, hey, yeah, we, we, we goofed. To be honest, sometimes they will call me and tell me, well, we found the problem, we corrected it. Sometimes they will not call me, but they will make a note in their system and make an improvement to the product. Um, some of the manufacturers are putting QR codes on their items now that will actually take you to their site and show you what the improvements are, what the installation process is. Uh, most of those are remand products. Um, but they are. Do we have time in the bays for that, John Long? You have to make time sometimes. Um, if you don't, I mean, your tech has to take the time. It's all about the the quality and not the quantity. Like Joe was mentioning earlier, you, if you don't make the time, if your techs don't have time, then you have to slow them down. Sometimes you got to slow down to speed up. And I don't, I'm a firm believer in that. If you don't slow down, you can't get everything done fast enough if you kind of follow what I'm saying but you have to slow down sometimes to speed up and make that time for them to check the parts make sure what see what the failure was if it came back that way we know we have to know slow down right Joe slow down to speed up I love that I, I, I believe the same thing Sometimes you have to throw the stop card down. I say it to my techs. You have the ability to throw the stop card down, but push the stop button. You know, whoa, so let's slow down here. We've had a high failure rate on these steering gears. And why are we putting this gear back in this car? We know that the probability it's going to fail. And like Gary said, yeah, you do want to have that report back, but sometimes you don't get it back. You never know what happened to that part, which is sad. Or sometimes they don't, I don't know what happens to the part, but you do want to know because we're all in this together. You don't want your guy down the road, your, your colleague down the road, another shop getting that part. And it makes us all look bad. It's mm -hmm. just not about your shop. You talk reputation. It's everybody. It's the whole aftermarket. Guys, if you're tracking and there's a, there's a checkbox on your spreadsheet that says failure part, failure systems, s internal, what's the percentage that uh, you, there was a procedure done wrong on the inside misdiagnosis versus the part? Can you guys truthfully give me an idea? If I'm understanding the correction correctly, you want to know the ratio of failure from a technician as opposed to a part? Yeah, the, the internal procedures, misdiagnosis, we did something wrong. The two big failures that we see is communication errors. Like, like Gary was saying, where it's not being written up properly from the beginning or the technician is not getting the correct information. And the other one, believe it or not, is, is part failure. We see uh, uh, more part failures than technician errors. And look, the quality techs, they want to do the right job. They really do. They, when they see that car coming back, they know immediately. They don't know the customer's name, but they know it's a blue Nissan they worked on last week. They know it. They memorize the car like it's part of them. They don't want to see a comeback, and they take it. They take it seriously. So when they do mess up, if it's if it's a real problem, plus it goes back to what I was saying before. You want the technician. Look, sometimes things happen. You break a bolt. Something happens. The oil drain plug is stripped a little bit. But you don't want that process. Like John said, you want it rushing through. Let's slow it down a little bit. Look, the drain plug is stripped. Let's fix it or let's repair it. Whatever we got to do. So to answer your question, I think it's communications first, part errors uh, uh, would be second, part failures, and then it would be technician error in that order. I would have to agree. Communication is, pro is our biggest problem that we have it when, we, when something gets messed up in the line. It, it, communication between the front office and the back office and the customer. Um, most of the times that we have issues, it's because of communication with a customer on some former former on some level i agree like i said before it starts at the front door you got more questions you ask the more information you get the better your diagnosis and repair is going to be thank you for that joe communication errors part failure tech errors in that order 33 33 33 guys um wow I'm going to go 50% on communication. Yeah, okay. Yeah, close. 
I agree. Yeah, I I'd say it's yeah, definitely yeah. fifty to maybe even closer to seventy five yeah. percent for me. Yeah. Absolutely, communication. Tech failure, them actually pushing a car out that's not right. I, I, I don't see that too often. I, I really don't. Okay. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody, but but I, I don't see that too often. It does happen, but I don't see it too often. Fifty, forty, ten. Good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you joe <laughs> thank you joe yeah you started thank you for finishing yeah that's great <laughs> hey guys let's talk about costs um gary key sent me a very interesting printout here and i'm going to attempt to share my screen and you know gary uh, i i don't mind that you kind of go over this but uh i don't want to go over every detail line but i think the idea here is to show the enormous costs that happen. And if, if, you know, and if communication's a big issue here, uh, then I guess this, this is a, a big factor in the, in the company. This is a uh, case study we did with AASA and ASA um, working on their warranty task force a few years back. And we just took a, we took a simple Honda power steering rack and what the, what the revenue was on the first job um, include not including the total cost of the job, but including the profit, labor, profit on the rack. So you're looking at seven hundred and sixty-three dollars revenue on the first rack, and then we kind of worked away back down through it what it would cost when it comes back. And if you can see down there, it's uh, almost twelve hundred dollars to do their comeback. That I think is the surprise that so many guys don't even stop for a moment and do any calculations. I mean, I think in, in, in your gut, John Long, for example, you say, I know this is going to cost us a lot of money, but have you ever done any math? No, I actually, I haven't. I, not to this level. Um, you know, you know, it's going to cost you money, like you said, but I have not done the math to this level at all. And that's something I should probably be doing and everybody should be doing just so we have a better understanding of what it is. Joe, in my mind, in that spreadsheet for that comeback, you know, that, that you're listing, you could almost have off to the right, you, you know, an automatic, you know, your labor rate is, and it would almost, the minute you enter it, it starts building yeah. what, what, what your cost would be. And, I, and, and wouldn't it just be great discipline to have internally to take a look at this and to see, you know, that we're putting ourselves in the hole because we broke a process? Well, it, you know, absolutely. Because once you see it, once you realize the, the, the true cost of what uh, the comeback uh, is doing to your bottom line, you're going to make a firm effort to say we have to, we have to find ways to, to, to eliminate this, avoid it. While you can't avoid every situation, you have to work toward, uh, toward a goal of, of, of reducing comebacks. So this is really, to do it like this is great. And you can, you can put some of these items into a spreadsheet that calculate automatically and, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think we could get close, at least on that on that that line to to, yeah. to recognize, and then share it with the team and let the team realize that up oh, here comes a comeback. We are getting our we're, we're digging ourselves a hole. Yeah, and, and and I love what you guys talked about earlier. You know, we need to sit down and figure out. You know, again, is it communication error, part failure, tech error, and those two internal pieces, com and tech, are things you could work on. The parts. Hey, Carm, one thing we didn't figure in this was your reputation, your customer confidence. And that's a great, great thing to bring up, Gary. And uh, I don't mind. Let me stop sharing this screen and talk about reputation. In the eyes of the customer, anything is a comeback, even if the customer has to come back for a, uh, a missed oil, oil change sticker. That, that, that's a comeback. So, and, and that shows uh, a breakdown in the process. And then the customer starts losing confidence because they, they kind of figure to themselves, well, if you missed that oil change sticker, what else did you miss? You know, so, and, and that's a problem. So it could be anything from the wrong oil filter to a simple reset of maintenance light. So everything has to be looked at in terms of reputation. In the eyes of the consumer, it's all bad. So we have to do our very, very best. That's why it goes back to what everybody's saying earlier that, you know, and again, I love what Gary said. It starts at the front door. I love that. Um, and then it goes right through the process and, and you have to have some, and that's, and there should be some sort of follow-up system also where you're calling. Cause sometimes look, the kiss of death to a restaurant is when you have a lousy meal and on the way out, 
the lady at the front door <laughs> says, how was everything, sir? And then, right? And you say it was great. And then you walk out, you tell your wife, I'll never be back, right? So, um, and that's the, that's the kiss of death for our business too. And, and, and so follow-up calls, you have to make sure that you're calling enough people to, to get a good barometer of what's going on and kind of probe them. Is everything okay? And then go through, so go through that checklist of making sure that the customer is telling you the truth about, uh, about what's going on. Because once you call them, that you have a better chance of them telling you, you dropped the ball here and there. So it's a problem. Reputation is a problem. It, but let me just tell you one thing. I've been in business 37 years. And your overall reputation of who you are can overcome, because you're going to drop the ball, let's face it. But it can overcome some of these things. So, And, and if you follow up and you follow up and, and, and do the right things, um, it'll lessen the blow. All right? No one wants to see a comeback, but it'll lessen the blow. Joe, your, your messaging on your website is very powerful. Yeah. And Thank you you. Know, it's, it's all Thank about you. honesty and integrity. And it's all about, you know, hard work and caring and that the customer is first. Uh, I'm sure, Joe, your people are first and they take care of the customers. I'm sure that's the kind of culture you have. And yep. great, great messaging. And that is a reputation builder. And as you just said, it can help overcome problems. Yeah, exactly. you just You just mentioned call the customer. Is that a big discipline inside your company? It has to be. It has to be. Yes, it is. Because yeah, especially first-time customers, their anxiety level is way up here, first-time customer. They don't know what to expect. Even if they're recommended by your top customer, they really don't know what to expect. So you want to ease that anxiety throughout the entire process. and and then it continues on after they leave. So you wait that 24, 48 hours, and you give that customer a call. Is everything okay? That just that improves customer retention, and it helps to, again, it helps to set the tone of who you are as not just the person that's repairing cars, but you're part of the community, and, and, you, and, you're part of, and you want to make this person part of your overall community family. So, John, uh, we have a bad experience at a restaurant, like Joe said, and, you know, we're hanging out with our friends a few days later, and it says, don't ever go to that place. I mean, that's, that's the, the hard part of, of, a, of a bad rap. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it can snowball from there because you tell those people, and then they go and they have for, talks with their friends, and they tell the same, the same story. So, I mean, it's, it, like I said, it can snowball and get out of control. So, I mean, you have to do like what Joe was saying. It's kind of cut that off and do your callbacks, you know, 48 to 72 hours and try and get ahead of the problem. If you don't get ahead of the problem, it's going to snowball out of control and you're never going to catch up. Amazing how um, our industry has a marginal rep when it comes to automotive repair and how hard guys like you are working to change it and to fix it. And God help the comeback. And, you know, I don't know about you, Gary, but I'm sure it's just a bad feeling inside when something shows up like that. Well, it's a bad feeling because we're actually trying to do the best job we can for the customer. So when, when they have a problem, you know, it, not only is their problem, it's our problem. Um, so we work, we re work really hard to correct it and make sure that it doesn't happen again and, and to walk the customer through the process and, you know, ask them what, you know, what we can do for them to make it, make it right. So the QC, we talked about QC in the beginning and how important having a good uh, quality process is. Are you guys using a good QC at the end? And if you are, are you having an additional person do it that didn't repair the car? Uh, we are definitely. I mean, you have to, in my opinion. And I, we like the fact that a second set of eyes looks at the car. I mean, if you're looking at something or working on something for an extended period of time, you can kind of get blindness to it. And that's why I think it's important for us to have a second set of eyes on that to make sure all the little things are taken care of. You know, granted, we're not spending, you know, 30 minutes QC in a car. It's, you know, 10 to 15 minutes tops. But that should be more than enough to, to kind of catch some of the glaring issues that can get overlooked very easily. When you see a QC report, John, do you see that there are comeback prevention things that were caught? Oh, yes, definitely. Our, our techs will make notes and say, hey, look, I found this. I found X. I found Y. You know, and then 
it's something that I track, you know, we'll put that in the spreadsheet and it, it's not to beat somebody up in, in the back end. It's just, okay, is this person having a problem with this? Why are they having a problem with that? What can we do to correct it? You know, and it's not, like I said, it's not to beat them up on it. It's just kind of to, to fix the issue. What's the underlying issue of why they keep having the, the same issue, the same problem. So, Joe, before I go and ask you for your answer on this, one more thing, John. When we're talking the QC process, and you may find smudges in dirt, or maybe, you know, taking out the floor mats, uh, whatever your processes or procedures are, do you ever see, find anything that was a gross error that would have meant back in a week? I don't think we've ever, I've ever come across a gross error. Um, okay. We did miss a gross error when we didn't QC a car. We failed in the process. We had a process that just failed and we didn't do our QC on a car and we had a gross error and it, it cost us. Um, so that's why it, it's a hundred percent of cars have to get QC. If we fail in that process, we're going to miss something. Um, and it's, we've proven that. Joe, your opinion on that QC end of John Cross. I agree with John 100% everything, but I want to make one point, though. When you quality control that vehicle, let's say, and let's say it's, there's no smudge marks, there's no, everything is in place, the maintenance light was reset, everything looks good, I think that's the time to give the technician a little bit of a pat on the back. Because if you want to, if you want to repeat the behavior that you really want to see again and again, you got to tell the technician, look, you did a great job in that. Not one, I couldn't find one smudge mark. Oh, everything was perfect. Look at that. No, no, this, everything is beautiful. The car runs great because we only, what happens a lot of times is we only point out the bad. And when you see the, that quality control guy walking over to the, the technician, they go, oh, what, what did I do now? You know, I, I, there's a little smudge buck on the steering wheel. Well, you know, but he doesn't realize that the past 10 cars were fine. So if you want to change behavior and make that technician, because let's face it, the technician is like a little, it's like a little puppy dog. It's going to want to, re, it's going to want to treat, you know what I'm saying? And the treat is to say, Hey, that's a great job you did. So I think that praise goes a long way too with quality control. Again, it goes back to the, it goes back to the culture of your company. And if you want to improve or change the behavior, you got to give a little, a lot of pats on the back when they do something right. This way they'll, they'll re, there's more tendency to repeat that behavior again. Um, QC is definitely important. Our, our QC process is ever involving and, uh, we, you know, we're working on improving it all the time. I spend more focus on the procedures in the shop to make sure that by the time it's parked out front and ready to go, um, there shouldn't be any issues. So that's where we focus most of our attention now is to get the procedures right while it's in the shop. It prompts me to remember an episode we did. It could be 40 weeks ago now. <laughs> I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but if you go to the website and type in in the search and any of the search bars, concierge service. It was an incredible, in fact, it should be, now that I've seen the conclusion of this episode and your great talking points here, concierge service would be a great bookend to this because there was an awful lot of discussion about, if you will, white glove service and the importance of QC. So I think it would be a great bookend to, to what we're doing here today. I want to give you each a last word. And I know that there's an awful lot of struggling shops out there that have many areas of their business that they need to, 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 to solve and to fix. And they're working on so many different areas from business culture and processes and procedures. The show is about comebacks. Um, you know, give us your, your final wrap up. Uh, and, and I want you to specifically talk to a, a struggling shop owner who needs to uh, make a comeback process, you know, a, a high value stake inside of his business. Gary, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Uh, I'll start back where I started. Communication is the key thing. Communication between the, whoever is in the front desk and the, the customer, and then whoever relays that to the technician. So uh, the more information that you get through the process, um, just take, for example, drivability problem or intermittent problem, a noise, um, noise checklist. I got one 
uh, recently from somebody that uh, is pretty good and it just gives out different noises and you have the customer go through and check it. Um, to there, if you can relay it to the technician, um, it eliminates a great deal of comeback problems. John Long? For me, it's all about having processes in place and you know, standing operating procedures and following those 100% of the time. You know, if you don't follow them 100% of the time, you're going to have an issue. Just like I said, just like we did a few weeks ago, we had an issue. We didn't follow the procedure and it was a communication breakdown. So you have to have your procedures in place and follow them all the time. There can be no exceptions. Once you make an exception, then you're going to have an issue. Um, one last thing I want to follow up on that is, you know, a great quote from Vince Lombardi that I, that I try and follow to a T every day, perfection is not attainable, but if you chase perfection, we can catch excellence. Great contribution, John. Joe, uh, very um, important person in our industry, writes a lot for R&W and works with Elite. Uh, I know um, you, uh, you have one heck of a reputation. Uh, I'm going to cling onto your last words here. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I, I think it all starts from the top. And if you're a struggling shop owner, I was many years ago. And what I realized, it's not about me. It's about the people around me. So when you're speaking directly about, with regard to comebacks, it's the same as with any other issue with your company. It starts with getting everybody involved. It starts with having those processes. But more than that, it starts with whatever culture that you determine is the culture of of, of what, who you are as a person, that has, to be, that has to be spilled out throughout the entire company. And everybody in that company is, is, is a, a key person, a, a, a key component, I should say, to the success of the company. So get engagement from people. Ask for their help. Be a leader that, that they know that they can rely on, and you're going to take care of them. Um, put the emphasis, again, I'm going to repeat myself, put the emphasis on quality, not quota. The rest will take care of itself if you take care of the details. They say the devil's in the details. Uh, uh, no, it's success is in the details. So make sure that every single aspect of your business, that you kind of include the people around you. Your success is not determined in terms of reducing comebacks or anything else. It's not determined by what you do so much is by what, how you lead others and how they, they are included and they're going to care as much as you do about those customers. So I'm telling you, I'm, 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 the, the longer I've been around on this planet, the, the more I realize that, you know, people want to be praised. They want to be recognized for a job well done. And they want to be included in on the things that happen in their company. So if you want to reduce comebacks, my best advice is do everything that we're saying here today, but take it one step further and, and be that leader that really the people in your company say, you know, I want to, I want to follow this person, not because he's telling me to, but because I want to. By the way, there are so many shops out there that find themselves in a really tough position in a tough bind and wonder if they could ever make it to greatness. Episode 11, um, you came on in the early days of the podcast and you shared the most transparent story I had heard that year. And if anyone wants to know how they could get as successful as Joe Marconi is today, listen to his humble beginnings. Episode 11 and 12. We did it over two episodes. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Gary Keyes from E&M Motors in Stewart, Florida. John Long, partner in Shirts Thanks. Service in Shirts, Texas. And Joe Marconi, Osceola Garage. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.